Welcome to Heart to Heart Nurses, brought to you by the Preventive Cardiovascular Nurses Association. PCNA's mission is to promote nurses as leaders in cardiovascular disease prevention and management. Welcome to today's episode, and we have the great pleasure of having Jan McAllister with us. Jan, could you introduce yourself to our audience, please? Well, thanks. I appreciate you having me. Um, My name is Jan McAllister. I'm a DNP nurse practitioner in Atlanta, Georgia at Piedmont Heart Institute. I run the lipid clinic there. I'm a clinical lipid specialist. Well, right before we came on air, you were telling me about the evolution of triglycerides, particularly in your career, and I thought it was a very compelling story. Would you be willing to share that with our audience? Oh, most definitely. Um, So back in the day, um, my first nursing job in 1991 as a registered nurse, um, inpatient, they had actually checked a lipid profile on a patient and the triglycerides were over three to 400. And I went to the cardiologist because I was on the cardiac floor and said, what are we going to do about these triglycerides? And he goes, oh, we don't worry about that. They're not that important. And so there was a big debate for years, are triglycerides atherogenic? Is this a cardiac risk factor or is it just LDL? People would go back and forth, back and forth. Uh, 2018 ACC AHA guidelines came out and they included triglycerides as a risk enhancer, but not a true subject of treatment. And now we have the 2021 ACC consensus statement that has a whole algorithm with four different patient groups to treat triglycerides. So why do you suppose it is that triglycerides are not part of what a patient's thinking about when they come to a clinic visit, when they get their labs? You know, it seems to be not something that they have heard before, maybe even. It's not on their priority list because we have spent years ingraining LDL, LDL, LDL. We have targets for LDL. We have numbers for LDL. Uh, doctors, primary care cardiologists are saying this is what we, where we want your LDL. A lot of patients for a while did concentrate on HDL. Um, because we had medications out there for that, which didn't really pan out. So that's kind of gone by the wayside. But I do find that when you start talking to patients about their triglycerides and what causes high triglycerides in the bloodstream, uh, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to recognize it uh, because a lot of it is dietary induced and not necessarily uh, something else that a quick pill would fix. And so can you talk a little bit more about those secondary causes of uh, of so prob- anemia, sorry. <laughs> so, so probably the number one uh, secondary cause of hypertriglyceridemia is uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, diabetes is a sugar diagnosis. And so triglycerides are elevated with sugars, carbohydrates, and saturated fats. So if you have an uncontrolled diabetic and they come to you and they have triglycerides of 300, 400, 500, and they have a hemoglobin A1C of 12.3, I don't care what you do. You cannot control those triglycerides until the diabetes is controlled first. Same thing is true with thyroid. You have to look at underlying causes Uh, Make sure they're euthyroid and that that is not part of the problem uh, creating uh, the issue of the triglycerides. Many people don't realize in cardiology, what are some of our drugs that we use a lot uh, for blood pressure? beta blockers and uh, thiazide diuretics, and that these can increase triglycerides. So some of it is drug induced. Um, I recently had a 20 some odd year old patient come to see me 
uh, who was recently on Accutane, and that will dramatically increase LDL and triglycerides. So it's important to include the patient in the conversation and discuss what may be another cause and lead into, if you can't find a secondary cause, how do we make things better and then do a complete review of their diet. We are in conversation about very high triglycerides, and we're going to take a quick break and be right back. For more education, resources, and tools for your clinical practice, visit PCNA.net. You'll find CE courses, patient handouts, and more, all free to access. Visit PCNA.net. We're back with our conversation with Jan McAllister, and let's pivot just a little bit to treatments. I heard you talk a little bit about some of the potential causes of this, but how do we go about treating it? Well, if you look at the 2021 ACC consensus guidelines, um, they have a clear pathway for four different patient types and where their um, triglycerides are and where their LDL is, because we still know that LDL is very atherogenic. And for those individuals high risk with uh, ASCVD or intervention, um, their LDL still needs to be treated. So there is a way to get the best of both worlds. We don't have to sacrifice one for the other. Um, so you're still looking at the LDL, but to, in order to treat the triglycerides, which we do know is a cardiovascular risk factor and does attribute to cardiovascular disease, uh, the guidelines say the first therapy for the patient is diet. And that can involve a dietitian that can, first you have to do a complete review of what they're currently eating. Um, but if you have patients who are morbidly obese, they are more likely gonna have higher triglycerides than those individuals that have a relatively normal BMI. Um, and the diets that are higher in carbohydrates, higher in simple sugars, higher in saturated fat, higher in alcohol, those are going to raise the triglycerides more than individuals who are eating their lean proteins and their vegetables. So beyond that really important diet aspect, you had mentioned before the break about how some of the high triglyceride uh, values that some of the patients are facing is because of some of the drugs that they are taking. So you mentioned beta blockers and even Accutane and things like that. Is there ever a shared decision-making conversation about that or would there be any benefit at all to changing the medication dosing? I'm just curious. I don't even know. 100%. Uh, it is shared decision making to all team members who are part of the uh, patient's uh, care team. Uh, certainly if um, changing to another uh, high blood pressure medicine is certainly very easy to fix. Um, controlling the diabetes. It is amazing what happens when you take a hemoglobin A1C from over 10 down to seven, how the body habitus changes, how the triglycerides, the entire lipid panel will change. The HDL will come up. Um, so most definitely treating the underlying causes, changing medications, if you are able to, are gonna help the cause. But inevitably, if we're putting the wrong gas in the engine, the engine isn't going to run efficiently. I so appreciate that. So that qu high quality fuel um, in terms of lean proteins, lots of plant material, fewer donuts, sugar sweetened beverages, um, fast food, there you go, um, really makes a difference. And I, it would impact not just the triglycerides, the, but other parts. And so you'll be healthier overall, less inflammatory markers. Um, 
you have just sung the praises of a heart healthy diet, have you not? I have, and unfortunately, um, in in the U.S., obviously, we have multiple cultures all involved in our wonderful United States, um, and many different cultures have just ingrained as a part of their heritage higher uh, carbohydrates, higher processed foods. Um, also our lower socioeconomic status, it is more expensive to eat a healthier diet than it is to go to a fast food restaurant and get the 99 cent meal. Um, so cost is a big issue as to why patients don't follow the healthier diet. And I would say another one is food deserts or quality food deserts that Maybe the only food source in the neighborhood is a convenience store that doesn't carry fresh fruits and vegetables. Maybe there's not a farmer's market or a delivery service that brings quality vegetables to the area. So it can be quite a challenge. And I know that some communities and some healthcare professionals have the ability to do a produce prescription where they partner with local farmers markets or other organizations to make those fresh fruits and vegetables more accessible and more affordable. So that's one way to potentially meet the challenge, but that definitely takes a community-wide effort. 100%. I know a lot of growers do that as well, come into communities and you can order directly from a grower and they come in, it's all in their trunk and you purchase it once again, if you can afford it. Right. Is there anything else that you would like our audience to know that we've neglected to discuss already? No, I would reiterate that um, triglycerides are atherogenic, and it's not really the triglyceride itself. It's the remnant particles that you get from the triglycerides. Triglycerides are not atherogenic, but the remnant particles that are produced from it are and can get into the intimal of the artery and that's where they start to form plaque. So the more we can do, the better off we are. Thank you so very much, Jan McAllister, for being with us today and sharing all of that exceptional information. I know that Jan is going to encourage us to lead by example and eat healthy ourselves as best we can so that we can model that for our patients. Thank you again for being here. This is Geraldine Warfield, your host, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Heart to Heart Nurses. We invite you to visit pcna.net for clinical resources, continuing education, and much more.